Hi, Lois. Hello, Estelle. I'm sorry. Lois is in here right now. Oh, okay. Just wanted to ask how you... Are, are oh. you doing okay? Are you how okay? What is doing? I mean, it's just like absolutely awful. I hope Rabbi's family are all okay in Jerusalem. Your your family, Rabbi's family in Jerusalem. Yeah, I hope they're all okay. Yeah, I know. We hope you come down. Do I you know. Have any family or friends? I, anyway, uh, yeah, we have we have cousins in Israel, but I I, I think they're okay because they, oh. they they were they were in in, in the north, you know, in Jerusalem. Yeah. And, things like yeah. that so well i was just listening to i24 news which is you know the from israel mm -hmm. i just had um a lot of rocket attacks a, a <laughs> rocket that landed in jerusalem quite a few people were injured really Hello, bye -bye. um what were you saying estelle i, I just came in right on that yeah i was that. just listening to i24 news the news from you know the Israeli news, yeah, and um, it just said that some rockets had landed in Jerusalem, and it's some people you know quite a few people were injured. And just your now? son, and it, well, this was yeah about a few minutes ago. I mean, I don't know when the yeah, um, it's just ongoing. And your son and family are they all okay? Well, they were. <laughs> Oh, Shem, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> no, I'm glad. No, I'm, I, I don't want to hold back anything. I'm assuming there still are. Here, if I get a phone call, I'll let you know. Um, but of course, <laughs> this is the world turned upside down. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Um, do you know um you know the the news yeah. said that uh israel's cutting off food electricity and uh, all kinds of other things is that on condition that the hostages aren't really is there going to be some kind do you think uh, um, i don't know i didn't hear about food i i heard electricity I now, uh, electricity and water have been cut and off. Water. Water, they cut yeah. off the water yeah, that's what I heard. I don't know. I, I, the way 
I don't know how to know. I don't know how to know because every two seconds you see something. I know you're going to hear something different and yep. hear something else. Yeah. yeah. I did hear in one report they did say that <clears throat> there are two million people living in Gaza, or maybe more than two million, who uh, did not were not asked to vote on any of this, but are going to bear the brunt of it. And that is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is a, it's a, it is a terrible reality. And it was one of the wisest things that Golda Meir is quoted as saying, which is that Chosen. line about maybe someday we can forgive you for killing our sons, but not for making us kill your sons. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hope we never, I, I've seen people just say, kill every last one of them. Of course, of course. Right, of course. and that's, yep. that they're angry and whatever, but certainly we can't mean that. Right? <sighs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, I heard, I think it might have been yesterday, the IDF just telling all the um, the civilians in Gaza to move to to move away from the areas that as far away as possible from where the Hamas from where, has uh, from where the um, terrorists operate. Yeah. Yeah. And that has been the mode in the past where they dropped yes. leaflets yes. and stuff. Like that, but yeah. who knows? Yeah. Also. We, we have this assumption that Israel knows what it's going to do and they know how to do what they're going to do. And uh, part of that has been shattered. Yes, that's what's so shaken about it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, Hashem runs the world and He's the mm. one we have to appeal to. Absolutely, so. yes. Yeah. That's rough. Oh. It's very rough, I agree. I guess it's strange for us to go on with a class, but that's what we're supposed to do. Well, how did you go on with Simcha's power? Yeah, that's what I, so we, I know. So we, what happened was, here, before we go back on that. So the way it unfolded for me was um, that some people started coming to show who had, you know, had heard and watching it. And they started to come in and started to tell us what they had heard. And then there were some people that called their, family and they were coming in and it was this weird situation because of course it's it it's always weird when you have a show where some people are driving and some people you know like it, you have all different kinds of experiences going on there and um and especially here when you're relying on people that were watching tv or calling people and stuff like that so that was already weird <clears throat> and then so i'm hearing my personal experience is like everything I'm getting is third hand at best third hand, you know, like it could be fourth hand. Um, and so there's a part of it that seemed real and a part that didn't seem real. So um, obviously I knew it was real, but it's still, you have that kind of sense of distance. So we decided that, we're going to um, go, we're going to uh, have Simplest Torah. Because for us, it was already Simplest Torah, right? When did we hear about it? I don't even know. Right? Did we hear about it? Before, and we, we heard about it when it was Israel's Simplest Torah, right? So, so it, was, it was Saturday night when we heard about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, so I don't remember when I first heard about it, if it was Saturday night or Sunday morning. I don't know. 
So, but anyways, we decided we're going to have simplest Torah, but we're going to say to him, we're going to, in other words, we're going to obviously acknowledge what's happening, but we are going to Eve do us Hashem the Simcha. We're going to serve Hashem that now what we're called upon to do is to serve Hashem with joy. You serve Hashem in different ways. And if, if this had been a regular day, you may not have decided to get up and start dancing, although some people may have, but you, it may not have been what is expected, but it's happening on Simple Soro. So we danced, but we, we, um, we had it a little bit shorter so that we could do, we did a group after the Hakafos, we did a, um, we did a group um Tehillim. You know, we, we did Tehillim for about 15, 20 minutes. And um, but there was that point where we're dancing in that in your there was there were a couple people that were offended. <laughs> but my my and there's one who's only half talking to me at this point, but I my point to him was, what, what, what would you do in place of this? You go home and watch CNN. That there isn't like this is dancing as opposed to something else. Is that it's not like uh, we could be out, um, you know, collecting something to send there or or doing something else that could help with the. We're here. We're here, and right now here, what well, the only other thing you you're most likely going to do is be sitting on your couch watching CNN. How is that better than, than this? And also, this is what we do. And it happened to be, we read Kohelis that day and the rabbi, yep. the, rabbi the, the line, there's a time for eulogizing and there's a time for dancing. It's right in there. Yep. A time I was just going to say that. For dancing. So, you know, some people, you know, there there were like learned distinctions being made. Um, you know, so you're, you're, if you're if you're talking, it's ongoing. Ongoing is different than you know if it's a fait accompli. If there had been like mourning or a fait accompli, something had just happened. So you could say, you know, that you you the mitzvah is you know to be involved in the simcha, but this is ongoing. Yes, it's ongoing, but there's nothing we can do. There, there, for us, it's not like not ongoing in the sense that we have some kind of something that we're supposed to be doing. So it was, it was uh, pretty confident that we're supposed to have simplest Torah, but we also had, you know, we 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 did have to heal him. and then at our Neila Sachag which was like a little gathering before Yom Tov ended. We did, you know, we talked about it. Then um, it was a kind of, I would say, somber Ne'il Sahag that we still sang. And we even sang the Samach the Bechagecha, but it wasn't uh, uh, with the same yeah. uh, tones. And maybe, I don't know if that, you know, there's what could we do and one of the things i was expressing was how i don't want yom Tov to end because i don't want to go into the re even though we know it and it is a reality it felt like once yom Tov is over now we're really in the reality of it and yeah i don't want to be in that reality you know liz's son um not only one contact her during his chag but also on our Simchas Torah, he wouldn't contact her till it was over here. However, she, by the way, her daughter Dara was furious at her brother, but that's that's another story, of course. Um, but yeah. he had uh, he had actually a friend who wasn't Jewish who got in contact with Liz and said everyone was all right. But I don't know how that Rabbi happened. Khan. There's a Rabbi Ari Khan who. Uh is a sort of influential teacher in Israel. And I've, I've met him and sort of friendly with him. He's a, he's a very interesting scholar. 
So he posted on Facebook once Yom Tov was over for Israelis, he posted that you that he believes you're allowed to contact your relatives, even though it might cause them to break Yom Tov. He had a halachic rationale for it. And he said, I, I'm not going to post the whole halachic rationale now, but if you want to contact me. So it, it could be that, um, you know, but it, I, I mean, it wouldn't, he's not like the chief rabbi, but he, he is a sort of influential thinker and he is a scholar. And that was sort of interesting that he was. I remember during um, the Gulf War, there were all sorts of leniencies that were in place um, for, for people because, but part of it was, which would be in, for people in Israel that would have been in place for them to contact each other, like, um, like to tell each other if you're okay, because, because otherwise people are gonna start looking for you and trying mm -hmm. to, like when the, so I remember um, on Shabbos, like uh, we had these whole systems for checking on people. But I remember there were all sorts of leniencies in place. First of all, you were encouraged to have your radios on and and be listening. Um, the whole time, of uh, course. Right, yeah. the whole time. And, but, but there would be other leniencies in place, especially to make sure that, um you could be in touch with people because of people's lives are at risk and they are now also the lives are at risk now so you would imagine that within israel they're allowed to call people i would assume in a lot of circumstances where you wouldn't think you could but, but something I like was... this especially if he got a gentile he did what he needs to do if he got a gentile to yeah to yeah he got it um well, I don't know if he gave him permission. I think the guy just did it because he knew he should. But um, I'm wondering, could you say, yeah. let's say you had a grandfather with a weak heart in in the United States. Could that be considered Pekua Very Nefesh? Very well. It could be. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. I mean, those are obviously questions for the very, you know, for the heavy hitters, but he said, I mean, it could be that's part of what he was basing his permit on, Ari Khan. He was talking about telling people you're okay. He's not, and that he he felt there was halachic permit. And he, when he says those things, he's not like a guy who's just, you know, weak when it comes to his boundaries. He, hmm. so, yeah. It's um, it's it can be very confusing <laughs> because uh, when you have come to a, a comfortable place in your religious observance, and there's you've created clear lines between what you can do and what you can't do, and then somebody's coming in and saying, "You see that line over there that you just drew real thick in the sand." You're, you're going over that line. And that could be very hard for some people because to them, it was a very thick line. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if somebody else is telling you it's a, it may not even be rabbinically forbidden. <laughs> you know, like uh, if you're doing X, Y, Z on our kind of phones and this kind of thing, and you've drawn a very thick line to prevent it because, you know, you want Shabbos to be Shabbos. And now somebody's applying leniencies. You may not want to hear those things. That's another thing. Or somebody's yeah. telling you it's not the end of the world if your radio's on. That, that, mm -hmm. that, could be, mm -hmm. that could be worse than the bombs for some people. Mm -hmm. I think I remember, did I? That was it during the Yom Kippur War or something? Anyway, it was a Yontuf, and there were stores that had a television on in the window of their store and the, there were crowds outside looking at well, the television. Well, I've seen pictures, but I don't remember if that was what that was. 
Oh, could also okay. be a world series. It could have been one one of the world series. So yeah, okay. <laughs> it was either the Yom Kippur World, I hope or, it was, world or World Series, <laughs> <laughs> or both, or both, or both. I did. I was wondering. I was asking the only other person in show who I at the who was next to me who I thought might know what uh, Orthodox synagogues did during that Simchas Torah of, from the Yom Kippur War. I was in Shul, but I don't remember. Hmm. I don't remember. I was only 12 or whatever, 12 or 13. And I was trying to remember and I asked somebody else, but he also, he said it was around when he was, he, just, he doesn't remember. But I'm sure there are people that have writings that people because there they had a couple of days to think about what to do about mm -hmm. you had a couple of weeks or at least a week and a half to decide what to do about simplest torah should we have a subdued one should we not have a subdued one should it mm. it'd be interesting to see what they what they wrote about it I mean, there are stories in Israel of these guys who had little sukkahs mm -hmm. out near their tanks. Well, we have that dispute in our house. I told David they should cancel Simplus Torah here. He said, are you crazy? <laughs> so, okay. He's there a chassid. David is a chassid. No, that, it's, there's a story, and I can't remember who was involved, but it had to do with uh, people from the... Uh, uh, what's the issue? I don't. One of the Slobodka, the yes, other one with Slobodka, <laughs> and there was uh, a rabbi there, and he was in Simchas Torah, and I. This was a long time ago. <laughs> yes, but he received that his uh, son had been killed. Oh, in the and, massacre, ever massacre? No, this was no. not the Kevin massacre. It was a different one. Because uh, the cover massacre, that wasn't anywhere near uh, okay. the Christ Torah. Um, uh, there was, it was an op. You know, okay. um, and they told him, and he nodded, and he went on dancing. And as gosh. soon as the holiday ended, they say he, he let out a cry that could be heard through all of Israel. Oh, yeah, we're sort of raised on those stories. Um, again, the one argument that somebody wanted to make against that is if it's ongoing. But again, in the, what, what in, do you mean? In other words, the right. What for us? What difference does it make if it's ongoing or not? We can't. What, we're what, not, what's ongoing? The tragedy, as opposed to, in other words, as opposed to a fait accompli, the person. Let's say you know somebody died, but that's, in other words, that's not changing. And now, the question is, what do I do today? So yes. somebody would say, like, there's a story with Dov and Amela, the in when the the baby that was conceived, that Batsheva conceived, the first baby Batsheva conceived, so it was born. And it was clearly dying. So he wouldn't eat. He didn't eat or drink. And then the, the, uh, when the baby died, he got up and cleaned up and moved on. And so they asked, they asked him, what, why were you crying and fasting? when the baby was dying, but now that the baby died, you're not crying and fasting. So he said, there's nothing I can do about it now. When there was something I could do about it, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was crying and fasting, but now there's nothing I can do about it. He already passed away. So, and so, you know, it's something like that. There were people who were suggesting, I think that while it's ongoing and we could be davening, we could be, Whatever that maybe our posture should be more one of davening, saying tilling, tilling and and stuff, because um, it's still ongoing. The, the, mm -hmm. 
right to prevent something but um oh. um one of the subjects that we've been talking about in our mitzvah uh in one of the earlier mitzvahs which was the mitzvah to shecht animals. Um, so it came up today in uh, as when I was listening to Rabbi Rosner talk about def, our Daf Yomi discussion. So he brought it up as a branch of a conversation that was happening in the Gemara. It was really a little bit of a stretch to talk about it, but the, it was talking about shechita. And um, so he brought up the fact that the Rambam, when the Rambam lists this mitzvah, uh, he also lists it in his codes. In, in the codes, um, the way the Rambam does it is the Rambam will give like a little headline in the codes and then he'll give the laws the kind of in a kind of organized unfolding way so in the headline in his codes he wrote that um it's going to be uh that uh it is a positive mitzvah to um uh, shecht an animal according to the way god said and then to uh to um to eat the food so the Rivid, um, Rabbi Avram ben David, he um, criticizes that headline and he says it's it's not a mitzvah. <clears throat> Why is he listing it as a mitzvah? Yes, if you want to eat meat, you have to shecht the meat, but it's not one of the 613 mitzvahs. So the way it's typically explained is that the the Rivid, Rabbi Avram ben David, is suggesting that shita is what we call a matir. A matir means it's something you do to permit something. It, but it's not necessarily a um, it's not necessarily a mitzvah. So this line between and, and this is a is, is a kind of learned subject uh, in in many different discussions in the Gemara. Um, when is something a mitzvah and when is it a matir? In other words, and and we've talked about this to some degree. The Rambam himself has talked about this to some to some degree. You could have a kind of spectrum. You could have, there's certain behavior that we do that is, is not a mitzvah per se. Um, it's just like, it's permitted to do. Like, so for instance, let's say I decide I want to eat a snack. I'm allowed to eat a snack. It's not a mitzvah necessarily for me to eat a snack. You, you Somebody could work it out that since... I'm eating to live. I, it's the fulfillment of the mitzvah of Bahai uh, Baham that you should live through the mitzvahs or something. But you know, there's there's certain time where I'm eating and it's not to live for me. A lot of my eating is that way. But I'm allowed to. I'm allowed to have this snack. Now, in order to when I have this snack, there's a certain way to have the snack. So I'll make a blessing before, I'll make a blessing afterwards. And there's, you know, there's a certain way to do it. But the eating of the snack is not a mitzvah per se. So there's certain behavior in my life that is permitted behavior, but is no mitzvah. Then you could say that I, on this spectrum, I start to move into mitzvah territory. So for instance, let's say I'm engaged in something that permits me to do it like for instance would i say would would you say that that blessing 
that I said before the food? Was that a fulfillment of a mitzvah? Now, technically, it's not a mitzvah in the Torah to make the blessing before. The mitzvah in the Torah is to make a blessing afterwards under certain conditions. But you could argue that it's a rabbinic mitzvah. You know, it's, it's a fulfillment of a mitzvah. In fact, there were, I don't remember who, but there was a Hasidic Rebbe who said that when he eats an apple, he, you know, is, he considers eating the apple an opportunity to praise God. Instead of the blessing sort of easing the way for him to eat the apple, he sees the whole institution of eating the apple as a means for him to praise God. So to him, the blessing is the whole reason he's even eating the apple. For another person, the blessing permits the eating the apple. If I don't make the blessing, I, I don't get an opportunity to eat the apple. I'm not allowed to eat the apple. What it, um, and this is where that area of, um, of shrita comes in. Uh, is, is shrita, would I go out of my way uh, to eat so that I could fulfill the mitzvah of shrita. In other words, so let's say uh, I'm I'm longing to have a connection with Hashem. So would I um, be inspired to take a chicken and uh, shech the chicken as, so that I could connect to God in a particular way that is afforded by the mitzvah of shkita, or no, there's nothing added. Like, it seems like that's what the rivet is saying. No, there's, this is not, this doesn't connect you to God in any manner or form unique that you need. The only reason for shkita is it permits you to eat meat. So, and so uh, let's say um, uh, Rabbi Rosner brought this up in the name of Rabbi Cement from Chicago. Um, that, uh, you know, in one of his uh, books, Rabbi Cement mentions, he talks about this topic and he mentions tzitzis. Like, because we're not, you you can't wear a four-corner garment unless you wear tzitzis. So he was saying, would the Ravid say that the whole purpose of putting those tassels on is just to permit you to wear a four-corner garment? He doesn't think so. He doesn't think it's tenable. There he thinks that even the Ravid would agree that it that it's a mitzvah. We go out of our way, in fact, you know, uh, men go out of their way to wear tzitzis, uh, to actually go out of your way to wear a garment so that you can be surrounded with tzitzis. So clearly when it comes to tzitzis, we don't think of it as a way to permit wearing a four corner garment there, we think of it as a, a kind of mitzvah, even though it is true that it permits you to wear a four corner garment, but we still consider it a mitzvah in its own right. Well, but may I, hello? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, one of the things that's brought up, I think in that discussion, I remember is that it's still custom in many synagogues for the unmarried males not to wear uh, Taoists, and they bring that as you know, sort of in, in, as as evidence that it's really truly not a mitzvah, right? But then, if but but could it be because they're already wearing tzitzis? In other words, it, what if they weren't wearing tzitzis? Ah, uh, uh, okay. Well, that, that would be the thing. Um, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, right. Because it could be there. The, the question is, is there an Indian to have a talus on top of tzitzis? But let's say somebody wasn't even wearing tzitzis. Would would there would you then say that there's no, maybe they would, maybe they would. I know this is a subject that goes back and forth, but there's a, there's a kind of spectrum. Also on that, in that discussion, you have what we call heksher mitzvah. It's not the mitzvah itself, but it's something that enables the mitzvah. So uh, let's say building a sukkah. So is there, building a sukkah itself is not a mitzvah. It's, it's the preparation for a mitzvah. The mitzvah is gonna be sitting in the sukkah. But so should I go out of my way to build a sukkah? Is there any value 
and going out of my way to build a sukkah? Or is it absolutely add nothing or making matzah? Is there any value in making my own matzah? And you could see arguments on both sides. You could, you could see somebody saying that once it becomes a, a, a heksher mitzvah, a preparation for the mitzvah, that um, this activity itself allows for a particular kind of connection with Hashem that wouldn't be available in any other way. Um, so I, you, you could sort of, in this discussion on the kind of spectrum of uh, a mitzvah act, you could see how um, we, we also saw this, by the way, and this came up also in Dafiomi a few days ago, um, when it comes to uh, an offering. So when, when it comes to an offering, let's say the Pesach offering. So when it comes to the Pesach offering, there's a mitzvah to eat a part of the Pesach offering. There's a mitzvah to eat it. You have to go out of your way to eat, let's say, an olive size of the Pesach offering. There may be other mitzvahs, like let's say the, the other offerings, like the Chagiga offering, where you don't have a personal mitzvah to eat a piece of that offering. You just have to make sure it was eaten. So let's say you are, you're part of a household that has one of those offerings. Uh, you're not supposed to leave it um, uh, uneaten. Um, so there, you should I go out of my way to eat a piece of it? It may, maybe not. There might be just a mitzvah to make sure it was eaten. This came up because of the showbreads. With the showbreads, there's a, there's a, a uh, what would happen is at the end of the week, which was Shabbos, the they would take off the showbreads from the previous week and they'd put on the showbreads from the new week and then they'd share between the different watches they'd share the eating of the showbreads so at one point it became clear that there was i don't know how they knew this they sensed that there was no longer any special blessing in that bread the things had you know the general condition of the people had changed and there was no more certain elements, miraculous elements that had been there in the previous temple or maybe early in the temple, there were certain blessings that were there and certain miracles that were there that are no longer there. So it says that the modest Kohanim would not eat from these um, showbreads. And they'd let the other Kohanim, the other Kohanim who are not so modest would tear them apart and, you know, just devour them and so but it says the more modest ones the tsnuim it says didn't didn't um didn't eat from it um so they got eaten but they didn't eat from it and that's one of the kind of learned distinctions that's made they obviously held that there's not a mitzvah to eat from the show but it's just a mitzvah to make sure it was eaten it got it got eaten so that's another one of these things about you know mitzvah actions there's like a kind of spectrum uh, of mixed mitzvah action, what's called a mitzvah, what's not, what's um, what is, is there a benefit to go out of your way? So one of those, famously, is this argument or disagreement between the Ravid and the Rambam about shchita, is shchita mitzvah, uh, the kind of mitzvah you'd go out of your way to do, is, is shchita that kind of mitzvah, or is it just a matir? It's just something that permits. Um, the, you know, you to do something else. We we saw that there was a category of that, we, that I was calling like bureaucratic mitzvahs, where the Rambam would say, you don't need to go out of your way to do it, but if you're in this situation, this is how you must do it. So divorce. Divorce is, if, if you do divorce, this is a mitzvah to do it like this, right? So he's open to the idea that there could be mitzvahs that are, you're not going out of your way to do them, but they're required in a particular situation, it's still called a mitzvah. And the rivet would also be, you know, agree to it. And somehow that's different than what he's calling a matir, which is this, the, what they're calling a matir, which is the shkita thing. All right, that was our discussion today. I 
um, and together with you, our hearts are with uh, everybody who's afraid, everybody who's not afraid, everybody who's at risk, everybody who, who all the people that are captured, all the families of those people, all the people that have died or injured, our thoughts are with them and our prayers are with them and our learning is with them. Yes. Tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Rick. Yeah. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Bye, Bye, Lois. All right. Bye.